hat job, yeah. Cause they're a point to all these fancy clothes. With all these buckles from your head down to your toes. Very simple, but I'm just another girl. Thanks for joining us. I'm close to Sol and you're watching NLC Trans. Tonight I'm here with my dear friends and co-hosts, uh, Tara Alexander and Renee Benoit. And we have a very special guest tonight, somebody who we've actually been trying to get on the show, or wanting to get on the show. We actually oh, haven't been yes. pursuing you, but we've been wanting to do this. <laughs> it's we, we've been talking about this. Not fair to imply that he's been... Right. <laughs> we have, yeah, exactly. We have been um, planning and wanting to get a hold of you for a long time and get you on the show. This is um, Reverend um, Josh W. Pollock, and um, you are... Um, you, uh, you are with the um, Unitarian Universalist Society East, mm -hmm. um, and you are out of Man Manchester? Manchester, Connecticut. Um, and certainly you have uh, been a, 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 a big supporter of, um, of um, people like us and, and uh, people in the LGBT community. LGBT community. Um, certainly an, an a supporter and a champion of um, marginalized people in general, I think. Um, so we, we've really wanted to get you on the show. And talk to you a bit about that. You were a certainly um, a big supporter of the um, the recent uh, legislation we've been working on, mm -hmm. um, House Bill six five nine nine. We'll probably talk about that a little bit. But uh, but maybe if you could um, just um, give um, our audience a kind of a thumbnail of um, of what you're about and who you are and what you do. Obviously, you're uh, you minister up in um, the uh, uh, Manchester area. Yeah. Well. Um, First, thank you for pursuing me <laughs> and, and having me on the show. Uh, it's really great to be here. And uh, I guess just a shout out to all the, the viewers and the, and the people who watch online. It's, it's good to be with all of you as well. Um, so yeah, I'm the, I'm the parish minister at the Unitarian Universalist Society East in Manchester. I've been there, uh, this is, uh, I'm, I'm actually about to start my ninth year serving that congregation. Um, prior to that, I actually served uh, four years at the Unitarian Universalist Church in Norwich, oh. uh, or Norwich, 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 <laughs> as, as we say uh, down east here. Um, and uh, during a lot of this time, uh, since I moved back to Connecticut, I'm originally from Connecticut, I moved back with my wife in 1999, that's when I started in Norwich. Um, but I've also been very involved in the, first it was the, the co-parent adoption uh, movement and then the marriage equality movement and, and really during that time as well, the, what I call the transgender civil rights movement. Um, somewhere along the way we founded an organization called Connecticut Clergy for Marriage Equality because we realized that um, in most of the criticism and most of the opposition to uh, marriage for gay and lesbian couples was coming uh, from religious people um, and people uh, claiming faith as their primary motivation for fighting that kind of equality. So we thought, well, we need a, we need a progressive religious voice, a pro-religious voice to counter that. Um, and then along the way, uh, we realized that uh, there was this other effort to add uh, uh, transgender, gender identity, gender, uh, gender expression to the state anti-discrimination statutes and it occurred to us at Connecticut Clergy for Marriage Equality that we really have to be part of that effort too. And that's eventually why we changed the name to Connecticut Clergy right. 
for full equality. So I've, I've been involved in that effort for really since I've been in Connecticut, so about the last 11 years. And, th and that's how we first came to uh, meet you, um, was actually, I think, through the Transgender Day of Remembrance mm -hmm. last year, and then through CT Equality, as you were representing Connecticut clergy for full equality. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and, and I know from some of the information that that ended up being well over 300 clergy from around the state, yeah. lots of different denominations. Yeah. Um, at, right before the, um, the decision in the, in the marriage case, uh, where, where we got marriage equality from the state Supreme Court, there were uh, just over 300 clergy around Connecticut who had signed on to our uh, declaration of, of marriage as a, as a civil right, um, religious declaration of marriage as a civil right. And that was great to, to think in a small state like Connecticut, sure. you can get 300 ordained people, and these were all people ordained in their various denominations. Um, With like a th 138 towns in the state. Mm. Yeah. That's yeah, it's pretty impressive. It, we, we felt great about that. That was a real milestone. Yeah. Um, and then, and and so we we continue to have about 300 names on the list. To be honest, and I I, <laughs> I don't mind being honest. Some of those people have died. Some of those people have moved away. Some of those people have retired. So our list is not quite as large as it used to be. But when we made the transition to really fighting for transgender people, um, most of the clergy were fine with that. There were a few who said, "I can't quite go there. I get the gay lesbian thing." transgender is, a, is very different to me or I'm still working on that. I'm still trying to figure out what that is. So a few people kind of defected, but most people seem to be right with us. And you know, some of that, some of that meant I support you. I'm not going to get involved. I'm too busy, <laughs> but know that I'm praying for you, that kind of thing. Uh, and then some people would come out to rally. Some people would speak to the press. Uh, and that was always just so important to have people of faith saying, yes, we're with this community, uh, this community deserves to be treated fairly and with equality. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's been very important to us, and certainly, certainly, um, speaking for myself, faith has been very important to me and, and very important in my transition. And, and um, I have been sort of um, amazed because because we have had some opposition um, uh, from from uh, um, the church a little bit um, in general uh, um, in the past, and certainly a lot of people that uh, that sort of um, um, use the, use the church use, use religion clubs. as a club to beat us. But the truth of the matter is that um, that we have had, for the most part. Um, we've had very good experiences, um, at least here in, in Connecticut. You can you can talk a little bit about your, <laughs> but but um, but but in general, we've had Swinging pretty good both experiences, ways. and and we've been very very pleased at how um, how supportive um, um, yeah. a lot of um, um, formal religion has actually been, and, and certainly you know we we were um, very pleased with your speech at uh, Transgender Day of Remembrance and very. Uh, very happy about that. It was a really good speech. Thank, and in you. Fact, I think, Thank you. I think we got that on the air. Oh well, yeah, yeah. We put the um, we put the entire T door yeah. public presentation. Yeah, it was very nice. And uh, will you have a copy of that? I do. Yes. Yeah. yeah we we aired that. <laughs> <laughs> but um, but yeah, it's been it's been kind of amazing at, at how um, how accepting um, uh, members of uh, of the clergy have actually been. Yeah, I mean we've had some opposition, but mm -hmm. uh, but not that much. In fact, in fact, we have a um, priest who was um, instrumental in helping <laughs> get our organization off the ground. Oh yeah, yeah. He he came he came across the community in his efforts to help the homeless. Yeah. Came across a, a trans person that was dealing with being homeless and not having a fair shake at the local shelters. And um, you're not talking about Father Bob, are you? No. Father okay. Bob. No. Yeah. Oh, so Father yeah. Carmichael. Father Russ Carmichael. Oh, yeah. uh, I, I know that name. Yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, it's it's been. Uh, I don't know Father Bob. Yeah, I don't know Father Bob either. But that's okay. No. Um, but yeah, it's been it's been actually a, a really um, uh, wonderful thing to to, to realize that um, there is that much support out there. I actually think in in faith communities in general in the United States, we're seeing a kind of thawing of that uh, hardline. Uh, but really, really was hatred um, or fear masquerading yeah. as hatred. I, th I yeah. think you saw it a lot um, after the Massachusetts decision on marriage equality. You saw a lot of people, uh, uh, religious leaders from around the nation coming 
to help in those protests in the follow-up, and it got very, very ugly. But um, what I also know, uh, and that a lot of con more conservative faith leaders know, is that if you if you survey young evangelicals, <laughs> young people in general, um, we're not seeing uh, that kind of hardline doctrinal stance on gender nonconforming people, right. um, on, on gay and lesbian identity. We're just not seeing it anymore. It's not that it doesn't exist. It's just it's not a wedge issue for young people. Uh, and, and there are young people now who, who, who when they hear uh, older ministers come out with that kind of invective, they leave the church. They're not interested. It's just, it's, it's just not a good use of, of spiritual energy sure. right. to, to uh, be challenging a whole community of people. And you know, uh, when, you, when, you, when you're seeing people from the various communities on television and, and they're out uh, as, as public school teachers and in their jobs and, and, and they're our neighbors, it's, it's just changing. And, yeah. and, and I think we're seeing that in, in faith communities in general. Yeah. It's a good thing. It really is. Um, faith is. Faith is getting back maybe to a, to a place of uh, values around how we treat each other and how we live our lives rather than what it seemed to be heading towards, which was we need to legislate what I believe. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, and certainly there are organizations. We have an organization that has vowed to fight um, to try to repeal <laughs> 6599, um, the, the FIC. Yes, um, and they they spout religion a lot, but um, but it it's them and not it's not uh, the clergy. It's certainly it's them. Right. Um, just sort of like I said, you, they use religion like a club. And historically, they've had a group of clergy around them, or yep. sort of in the same way that uh, the Love Makes a Family uh, organization helped organize Connecticut Clergy for Marriage Equality. Family Institute has always organized clergy, but I have not. I have not seen their presence in a, in a religious way recently. They certainly weren't around in, in this le no. latest legislative fight. There was, there was, in fact, it was one of the things that they were lamenting is that the Roman Catholic Church didn't stand with them until the very, mm -hmm. very end of, uh, of, uh, of the legislation, just That's before right. it passed. And even then, I, I really believe it was due to pressure from individuals, not because of any particular you know, desire, right? Or, or they would have been involved earlier, right? And they had been, uh, and they, they had been in previous years, yeah, yeah. So I like to take all of that as as a as a sign of, of cultural change. Yes. Yeah. And there's no one thing that leads to that, but it's but it's 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 people like yourselves doing a show like this. It's <laughs> it's people in the faith community uh, learning how to be welcoming and affirming to GBLTQ people. Uh, it's all those things. It's it's Ellen and Will and Grace and and all that <laughs> stuff. Even though sometimes those there's new stereotypes that get created because of these shows that don't really help. No, yeah. but you know, so it's I don't know that it's true, but to to some degree, um, any advertising is yeah, and and certainly it's nice to be able to look at those things and say, oh, that's a stereotype. If we're at a point where we can look at that and know that that's that's just a stereotype. That's There's at TV least a conversation. That, that, yeah, we at least, we've sort of come, you know, somewhere. We, right. We've made some headway when we can sort of look at that that way. So I think, uh, and yeah, it's, it's been amazing. Um, I mean, there was a time not long ago when, when I would have expected that this would have been very dangerous for, for people like us to, mm. to, to think about doing things like this. And, and I think... Um, well, the Jerry Springer show, for yeah. instance, they gave yeah, a very bad uh, <laughs> implement to... Yeah. It was really... You know, well, then they, some they, of the shows... They play on the stereotypes. Yeah, they, they, don't, don't, they do. And the deception. Exaggerated. Uh, yeah. Mm. But, but yeah, it's um, it's a good thing, and, and, and we've been we've been pleasantly surprised, certainly, um, in a whole lot of areas. Um, I think that that I you know I don't want to um, I don't want to suggest that discrimination isn't out there or that it's going completely going away. It's out there. There's no doubt about it. But um, but I think we've made a lot of progress, and and certainly getting six five nine nine passed this year, which was um, 
hugely um, good. <laughs> it was just a wonderful thing. We've been working on this for a long time. Well, yeah. Obviously, you've been working on this for a very long time. I believe this was the, it's either the fourth or the fifth, fifth time that this bill was raised. Six, uh, 2006, 2007, 2008, 2009, 2011. So, so the fifth, fifth time. time. Yep. Yeah. I think I've submitted testimony every <laughs> single time uh, and have been involved every single time. But one of the things that really felt great, actually going back to that Transgender Day of Remembrance, this is right after Dan Malloy had been elected governor, first right. Democratic governor elected in Connecticut in 20 years. Mm -hmm. And all along, for years, he's been a big... Right. ally of our community and he was saying I send me this bill I'll sign it yeah and we we didn't want to say that night back in November um, that it's a done deal but I remember saying in that speech this year we win yes. yeah this year we win and uh, it was so cool cool is not the right word <laughs> it was it was it, it was late on a Friday night when the bill uh, got passed, yeah. and it was about 2 a.m. or something, I had yeah. gone to sleep. Just sometime after yeah, we one. Were actually, yeah, we had a meeting that night, so we were actually up watching it. <laughs> we were cleaning up after the meeting, and we had the, we had the state legislature on TV. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I woke up, and there it was on the news, and I just screamed. <laughs> I screamed. It was, it was just such joy and excitement. My wife calls down from upstairs, what's wrong? What happened? <laughs> I said, we won. We won. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, it felt good. It one did. more, <laughs> yeah. yeah, one more positive change. Yeah, but. it's a step. I mean, obviously, there's more work to be done, but um, but this was a big step. So, yes. So we're we're real happy about that. Um, well, one more uh, thing about that: um, the the two people who had previously been the chairs of the Judiciary Committee, Mike Lawler and Andrew McDonald, yeah. uh, both of whom are out gay men had been uh, pit bulls in terms of, uh, I mean, that's a good, they, they were so uh, aggressive in their support yeah. of this bill and the, only because of a govern, uh, the governor's veto uh, they did not pass in, in 2009, um, but they both left. Right, we were concerned about that. And we wondered, well, who's, are the people who take over going to be as supportive? And I wouldn't say that uh, Representative Fox and Senator Coleman were as pit bullish in their support, but they were supportive, and yes. and it, it was almost like you didn't have to bat an eye. It was right right back. Uh, we had that legislative support, and and some of the uh, the African American legislators in particular were so clear. Yes. yes. That this is a civil rights issue. This is about fairness. This is about freedom. I don't even remember that dialogue so much happening in previous years. But some of these, like like Senator uh, Holder Winfrey. Yep. So clear and yeah. so just brilliant, I thought about. In fact, the... Um, and, and Hewitt, for, who was a... Uh, yes, for yep. right here Representative from Hewitt yep. right here from New was, London. Um, also what, on Judiciary yeah. Committee. Yep. Said a lot of really um, there, great things in that. And with, 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 with any kind of experience, with, with, with any kind of bill, with any kind of thing you do in your life, you're going to bring your own life experience. You're going to have, as you like to say, your own... You're, uh, you're going to see the world through your own prism, uh, the, the prism, prism of, of your own, own experience. Yeah. Your own experience. All right. And so, yeah, I mean, it, it wasn't, um, we were talking about fairness and equality under the law, you know, um, employment non-discrimination, we were talking about housing and credit non-discrimination, public accommodations, and they, I think, made the leap to, this is discrimination, this is unfair, this, this yeah. has to change. Yeah. And I know at the, ju at the uh, Judiciary Committee where they, they were taking the testimony, yeah, some of them were very clear, not just in expressing their opinions, but in calling to the carpet, in, in, in calling to task the people that were trying to imply otherwise. That's right. right. Yeah. Yeah, that was really very good. Um, I, was, I was impressed. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, it, it really is. You know, it's a, it's a, it's a wonderful thing. Because, you know, we've, we've always sort of been trying to be a little bit careful about comparisons. Yeah. You know, because, yeah, you know, it, 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 that, can, that can be a little bit hard. Um, you know, when you're comparing uh, marginalized groups and things, you have to be a little bit careful with that. And, and I was really pleased that um, that um, some of our uh, our senators and representatives pretty much, you know, came out and said, you know, this is what it is. And, and people that have experience certainly with with discrimination. So, so that was a, that was very very moving. Well, yeah, it was it was very nice to be sitting in the room and. 
to hear them say those things because we were certainly sitting in the room when other things were said that were hurtful yeah. <laughs> hurtful and i guess i can leave it there right, <laughs> right. yeah yeah so um how do you minister to someone when they when they start talking about leviticus says this leviticus says that and but the bible doesn't allow and mm. god hates gay people and how do i minister to them well <laughs> thanks Usually for they're seeing not you to me for ministry <laughs> Well, okay, maybe it's a poor choice of words, um, but you how know, do I respond? Sure, when you when you see the Westboro Baptist Church mm -hmm. picketing a, a funeral, and right? Things like that. How do you how do you get to that point? That uh, I think it's a good question, and I think over the years I've 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 tried different things, but one of the one of the things I've learned is that when someone is so grounded in their biblical interpretation. There really is nothing that I can say to them that will convince them otherwise. Uh, and that the best thing for me to do is not to get angry, not to try to match them uh, biblically, because you can't do it. Um, and, and simply, uh, what, I would, what I would call, take, take the higher moral ground and, and remain calm, remain humble, uh, say, I'm sorry you feel that way. I'm sorry you read your book that way. Um, you know, of course, you can point out that, you know, maybe there are seven passages in the entire <laughs> yeah. Hebrew Scriptures and Christian New Testament that um, came out of a very specific historical context. We're not even clear what, what the meanings of those passages are. All we can do is speculate. But again, they don't hear that because for them, this is a very, very much a living document. It's guiding their lives. Usually, uh, they're coming from a place where this is the inerrant word of sure. God and you have to follow it. Of course, you know, people have done some very funny things saying, you know, well, when, when do I stone my wife? Is it before dinner or, <laughs> you know? Yeah. It, it, How I mean, much do I sell my daughter into marriage for? Right. So, so they're often very inconsistent. But again, you can't. If you if you point that out, you're just going yeah. down a rat's hole. It, it it doesn't work, and it's it it doesn't result in in a civil kind of dialogue. So I, again, <clears throat> the best thing is to say hum, be stay stay humble and say <laughs> I'm I'm sorry you feel that way. Now, if they're if they're coming to my church the the 80 percent in the middle that are or the 60 percent in the middle that yeah are getting the messages on both sides i think i think the problem is for me most people coming to the unitarian universalist church are already aware that yeah. it's uh, a we, we say welcoming congregation uh, which is code for affirming of gbltq people um there's a there's a rainbow flag <laughs> in the lobby um uh, GBLT issues are often named from the pulpit. I haven't started using completely gender neutral pronouns <laughs> in my speech. That's hard to do. It really um, is. But but we're challenged to, to do that. And I and I I want to at some point try a sermon where I use completely gender neutral <laughs> pronouns and, and, and just just to illustrate a point of <laughs> how we're so stuck in the binary, you know. Um, but most people wouldn't come to me and say, well, what do I do with Leviticus? Most people are saying, what, yeah. can I, how can I get rid of this Bible? I'd like to, <laughs> it, it's been an albatross around my neck, and I'd like some other spiritual resources, please. And, and honestly, that's something that we've, we've talked about here. We talked, we've, uh, we've talked with other uh, religious folks as well. It's, and not to pick on them, but my own personal experience, having been baptized and confirmed Roman Catholic, mm -hmm. um, Roman Catholic Church tends to do a good job at chasing away its members. Mm -hmm. And when you find your way back to faith, it's not usually with them. <laughs> yeah, that's unfortunate. Well, uh, just to be fair, I, I think we all chase away members. We just, <laughs> we just do it for different reasons. You know, someone, it's, it's part of congregational life the minister says something or some leader in the church says something and it rubs someone the wrong way and then it happens again they say i don't think this is the church the for place me. For me, yeah. now if you're hearing if you're sitting in the pews and you're hearing uh queer people are an abomination and you hear that enough and you know that's you uh, yeah. and uh at some point you say i can't do this anymore sure. and then a lot of different kinds of churches do, do end up losing people because of that. Mm -hmm. But I think that's changing. I'm, I'm starting to hear about Catholic churches that are saying, um, in the beginning of worship, we welcome all people. We welcome gay, lesbian, bisexual, and transgender people. Now, 
they won't do the marriage. Sure. Um, they might treat, you know, if, you know, if a gay teenager comes in and says I'm suicidal, they, they might put, point them in a different direction than I might. Um, they, like they might not send them to true colors. Right. They might try to send them to some more, you know, firmly sure. established uh, therapeutic organization with heterosexist assumptions, right? But nevertheless, that's a major thing. If, if a priest is now standing up in front of their congregation and saying gay people are welcome here, that's very different than saying you're an abomination, and I applaud that, absolutely. Yeah, in fact, there was, um, I forget the group now, but there was a commercial released mm. uh, a couple months ago um, that, it, um, that we, we played yeah. that featured, um, it, it, it actually featured the child walking down the aisle mm. trying to find a pew to sit in, and you see the two adults walking behind him, and it's not until the very end that they really show that it's his two moms and, and people are all sort of turning their nose ups and sliding over and put, filling the seats and, until, until the, the man in the robe comes walking down and welcomes them into the church and ushers them to a seat. And it's like, you, you may not be ready for it, but they're welcome here. Um, and, and I know um, it's, Renee had a bad mm -hmm. experience with a church near her and we talked about that and you can talk about it tonight if you'd like. But uh, one one of the things that always got me was, if you send the people away, how can you do your job of ministering to them? If if even if you think what they're doing is wrong, <laughs> right? <laughs> you, how do you shepherd them to a better path if you send them away? <laughs> well, particularly now when there are so many denominations that are welcoming or trying to be welcoming, and and you know we say that people are church shoppers, right? <laughs> so sure. Religious consumer. <laughs> One can be saying, well, we love you, we welcome you, but we hate your sin. So it's love the sinner, hate yes. the sin. Yes. And the other church is saying, we don't think it's, it's a, a sin. sin. <laughs> so I'm still going to feel more comfortable over at that one. Yes, so so sure. there's a, you could say there's a little bit of competition going on. <laughs> That's always been true. I, I would be curious to hear your story. Yes. Even though I, I know it's been on the air before. But no, no. Uh... Uh, yes, I had a very bad experience. Uh, when I tried for us transition, um, I am Catholic and I was going to church every week and that's where my parents got married and I made my first communion egg and confirmation and um, I still believe in the Catholic religion. That didn't turn me away. Uh, how I did, I, I don't know why I didn't. But, uh, like I said, I had a bad experience with the uh, uh, priest um, that was there. Uh, one Sunday after Mass, uh, during Mass, I was thinking about, this was prior to the transition. Uh, I was thinking during the Mass, uh, am I going to say something or not to the priest? And I debated throughout the whole Mass, and I finally decided, well, I, I think I should do this. And after Mass, I approached the priest and um, I told him what, it, what I was planning on doing. And it, it was pure hell. <laughs> uh, it made me feel, you know, really awful about transitioning and going this route. And I, I finally said to him, I said, well, you know, I made my final decision and I'm sorry you feel that way but um, and I continued you know I left there feeling miserable um, and, and then um, I stayed away from the church for like a couple of weeks after that and then I was thinking why should I let the priest influence my beliefs mm -hmm. um, I says uh, who am I punishing the way I see it is that supposedly God loves everyone, not quotation Catholics, uh, you know. And uh, so I went back, and when I went back, the, the priest who was there was no longer there. That they had a new priest. Mm -hmm. So the one that they have now, I just continue to go every week and never said anything. Mm -hmm. So you're still there, but he's not. <laughs> That, that, that could qualify as those mysterious ways. Yeah. Yes, right, right. 
everything happens for a reason, I guess. So, everything worked out. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is one of the reasons I think I feel so strongly about providing a religious setting where, where people really do know they welcome, where, know that they're welcome and affirmed and, and able to you know, speak their truth uh -huh. and have it warmly accepted. Um, because you hear too many stories like that. And the last thing I want to do is, you know, slam the Catholic Church as a whole. I, uh, I think the Catholic Church does many wonderful things. Um, but it happens. And, and, it, and, and it happens in a lot of different religious settings where people say, you know, this is who I am. Mm -hmm. and, or this is who I long to be. Who I am uh, isn't, doesn't quite fit, so I'm going to make a change. And it's a moment when you're extremely vulnerable and really in need of support. And uh, I, I think the church should be there for people when they're vulnerable and when they need the support. support. Yes. I mean, that, that feels to me like, like a mission. Um, and so it's important. It's, it's, it's not just clergy who have trouble, you know, taking in this idea that, that someone really could express their, their gender differently than, than their born sex. Um, but clergy, I think, have a uniquely difficult time because, you know, if, if they're not clear about all the ramifications and, 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 and how it works, um, then they know that a lot of the people in their pews are probably not going to be clear too. And what do they do? If, they, if they're going to come out in support of this, community, there's some work they have to do. Mm -hmm. Sure. This is always behind that, you know, the, the, their, their response. Well, if I'm going to have to do this work, I don't have time to do this work. <laughs> I'm too busy. So I just can't, I just can't be with you right now. I can't, I can't provide, I can't be your pastor right now. Sometimes that happens. Yeah. So that's, um, was part of our work this year. Um, going back, uh, uh, I worked with Reverend Aaron Miller from the, mm -hmm. He's the associate pastor at the Metropolitan Community Church in New Haven. We went around uh, once down here in New London, once in Hartford, once in New Haven, once down in Westport, meeting with clergy to really have that conversation. We call it Transgender 101 for Clergy. Mm -hmm. So it's how do you talk about transgender concerns and issues in your congregation so that, you, so that your people are more comfortable. Right. Um, or the trans people who are there <laughs> already, which you may or may not yeah. know are there, yeah, are more comfortable, <laughs> and you can signal to them, you know, we're here for you. Yeah. Uh, and then, how can you get more involved in this this political organizing that we're doing? But mm -hmm. uh, but the, yeah. the the priest that's here now is, you know, he says good morning to me every every Sunday, and uh, that's great. It's very nice, you know, no no problem. So. Yeah. It, it still leaves a doubt in my mind, though. That does does he really know, or you know, mm -hmm. what does he really think? Shades <laughs> of don't ask, don't tell, right? <laughs> right. But I mean, that was that bears on what you were saying earlier about actually living an authentic life. Yeah. You know, where where maybe you don't have to worry about. Gosh, what if I slip up and I mention it? You know, then what's going to happen? It could be fine. It might not. But I don't know. Or are all the people around me wondering? Yeah. Because it's human nature to wonder about a person. Sure. And isn't that awkward? And can't we just talk about this? You people know? watching was one of the most fun things as a kid in the pews. Sure. <laughs> sure. Probably because you're bored out of your skull, so you start <laughs> looking around and making up stories about people in your head. Yeah. How come I didn't bring a little bag of Cheerios? <laughs> Of course. Nah. But oh. anyway, so um, I was hoping you could talk a little bit about um, some of the, the, the principles. The, uh, I know in the testimony you gave, there were some uh, principles the Unitarian Universalist Association emphasizes. And I know on the website, there were several principles mm -hmm. that were listed. And, and I think um, they, they sound like exactly what you'd expect uh, religion ought to be promoting sure. as opposed sure. to some of the more negative things we we hear in the in the press. Yeah, I'd love to talk about those. Um, and it may tie into your button. Yeah, it probably does. My standing on the side of love button. If we have time, I'll, I'll talk about that. Okay. Um, 
So, so first of all, one, one thing that's important to know about Unitarian Universalism is that we're not a doctrinal or creedal faith. So there's no theological statement around which we gather our religious communities. It's, it's, it's more about um, we gather around this set of principles, and there's seven of them, and, and they're more about uh, how we conduct our lives or the values that we want to bring to bear in the world as uh, people of faith and as faith communities. Uh, and, and the way I like to understand that is your theology emerges out of how you live your life rather than the other way around. A lot of times the question, at least in modern times, is what do you believe? Well, I believe X, Y, and Z, therefore I live this way. Right. Um, we start with a set of principles and, and, and our theology emerges out of how we live. So the principles were adopted by the Unitarian Universalist Association in 1985. They, they don't go way back to the beginning of time. <laughs> There's no you know, tablets from the mountaintop or anything like that. Um, and they really emerged through a democratic process where all our congregations, and there's about a th little over a thousand of them in the United States get together. They send delegates every year to the General Assembly. And in this particular General Assembly, we were coming up with the principles. Actually, it, it took a couple of years. Uh, the first one, which is the one we tend to quote the most, is the inherent worth and dignity of every person. Mm -hmm. And that certainly I, is, would be one that I'd reference in testimony on mm -hmm. the Trans Civil Rights Bill or, or virtually any bill. Um, because so often there's some social situation, whether it's a law or some kind of institutional structure or behavior, that is harming someone in some way. And um, it's, when, when the principle is the inherent worth and dignity of every person, you have uh, then a starting place to say, well, wait, if they're being harmed, if their dignity is being threatened, or somehow injured, if we're not honoring them as worthy, uh, then we need to do something about it. We need to get in there and fight for whatever change uh, is indicated. Uh, second principle is justice, equity, and compassion in human relations. The third is acceptance of one another. This is sort of an internal, you know, an in, inner, more of an inner church uh, principle. Acceptance of one another and encouragement to spiritual growth in our congregations. The fourth is the free and responsible search for truth and meaning. And again, that one for me ties back into this idea of no doctrine, no creed. Uh, but we really challenge our members to search. And the search is wide open, the search for what, what you believe. Again, uh, live in this world, act in this world, uh, and see what beliefs emerge. Uh, but do it responsibly. It's the free and responsible search for truth and meaning. Uh, fifth is the right of conscience and the use of democratic processes in, in our congregations and in society at large. The sixth is the goal of world community with peace, liberty, justice for all. And the seventh, which is probably the second, if not, well, maybe it is the most quoted these days, uh, respect for the interdependent web of all existence of which we are a part. And uh, in, in our congregations, the, the environmental movement has really taken hold. I mean, it's, it's, it's been a, a, a very core part of our identity for, for a generation now. Uh, but you see uh, congregations, our congregations, really trying to green their buildings, use green as a verb, <laughs> <laughs> um, green their, their practices. So in our church, um, uh, we did a building expansion a few years ago and we converted from uh, oil burning to geothermal heating and cooling. We reduced our carbon footprint by 70% in doing that. It's not completely green because we still have to run that system on electricity, but there's no fossil fuel burned on site. Uh, we compost, we recycle, all those things. Um, no, no uh, disposable cups or plates or napkins, everything's compostable. Or we use the china on Sunday morning if we're having, if we're having food. It's, it's, it's very green. <laughs> That's the interdependent web trying to... Uh, sure. That's very neat. Mm. Very, very nice. Very nice, um, very nice values. I, I, Recognizing that we're a part, a cog in the ecosystem. Yeah. 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 Which, it's always been something that, that um, well, I mean, even, even and to twist things around a little bit, the whole sort of 
and um, conservative vi uh, environmental movements that was uh, like Teddy Roosevelt, right? Republican. Protect the environment because sure. it's a right thing to do. Somewhere along the way, that's gotten confused politically. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but well, yeah, I think <coughs> uh, we weren't burning oil then either like we, <laughs> like we do today. True. Um, and I think part of his thing was uh, it, it's the uh, conservation. Conservation, yes. Conserving the wild places and the national parks. Mm -hmm. And part of what you want to be able to do is hunt. <laughs> right? And, and I get that. I mean, that, that's... I'm not a hunter, but, but I yeah. understand you, you know, that's a huge pastime for a lot of people. There's actually a, a lot of uh, economic viability in hunting, and, and um, certainly if we lose Ecological our wild... sustainability, Yeah, too. if we lose our wild places, if animals go extinct, then well, <laughs> there goes hunting. So. And if animals go extinct, 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 how far behind them are we? Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. But, so that's the principles, yes. and, and okay. certainly, um, I think in, in a variety of ways, Unitarian Universalists feel called to be in the public arena, uh, both the clergy and lay people, uh, supporting, um, we use the term marginalized groups or oppressed groups, pe yeah. people who are in some way um, uh, suffering from the, from the current political, social, economic arrangement, and uh, Certainly in, in our church, we do a lot of work around racial justice, uh, a lot of the environmental work, and, and then on uh, GBLT issues. The church has been, I think, very just outstanding in its, in its support and people's willingness to show up when we ask them to show up, you know, be present for whether it's the, the testimonies, uh, the lobby day, the rallies, the, the Transgender Day of Remembrance. Yeah. I know even even uh, down here we have a Universalist church here in New London. Sure, yeah, yeah. Uh, Carolyn Paterno. Carolyn Paterno. Uh, my good friend Carolyn <laughs> Paterno. I didn't want to get off off this show without making a plug for the yeah. All Souls Unitarian Universalist Congregation and, and on are, J Street. They are very very nice, and, and um, in fact, I've been meaning to get over there and talk to them. I, I certainly have, I've uh, been over to talk to Carolyn. Well, okay. Carolyn's a lot more fun than me, so you, you should have her on the show. <laughs> Yeah. She's definitely but, uh, show. but yeah, she's she certainly has been involved in a lot of the uh, a lot of the social goings on oh, yeah. in this uh, in this yeah. area, and uh, in particular, this may be a segue the um, um, uh, AFL. AFL, yep, the um, Alliance for Living. Thank you. The yeah. Alliance for Living is uh, is the is the only uh, HIV AIDS support organization in southeastern Connecticut, and I know Carolyn Paterno has played. Um, uh, oh, a big part in in their uh, in their walks and their remembrances yeah, and, and their fundraisers and such and and uh, so yeah every time we're involved in something here and you know socially related social justice related here in southeastern Connecticut you can pretty much figure she shows up yeah. <laughs> one of the usual suspects <laughs> yeah. so you know it's uh, well represented yeah. but, Certainly, I, I've, I've always sort of had a um, uh, warm place in my heart for the uh, Unitarians. Um, I, I had some involvement when I was down on the other end of the state a bit, and my my, my mother was involved with the uh, Unitarians in um, down in Stratford. Mm -hmm. Reverend, uh, it was Reverend CRC, I believe. Al CRC, yeah. Yeah, at, mm -hmm. at that time, but I, I'm not sure. Um, that's been a long time, so. I, but, um, but certainly. Um, Kind of a nice, nice approach to things. I always thought. Do you want me to segue? If you like. Okay. Yeah, sure. Sure. Um, since we were talking about the Alliance for Living, um, we still have a reminder here: the Shop for a Cause, which I know you can't read from here, but um, Shop for a Cause is an Alliance for Living fundraiser. Um, the Alliance for Living is the the only HIV AIDS organization working here in southeastern Connecticut, providing a case management, housing programs, food pantry meals, employment counseling, uh, medical case management, and promoting the elimination of HIV AIDS within the entire community of southeastern Connecticut. Um, they also have an educational prevention program called Positively Speaking, um, and they're looking for some help funding these programs. This uh, Shop for a Cause, um, you can go to uh, their website. We have it actually uh, posted on our website as well. Um, for $5, you can buy a shopping pass that on August 27th will get you 25% off your purchases at Macy's online or in any of the Macy's stores. And your $5 goes directly to the Alliance for Living. 
So Macy's is, is helping out there to uh, raise some money for the Alliance for Living and save you some money shopping at Macy's. Yeah, good deal. <laughs> and then the other, uh, the other notice that we're going to start to talk about is uh, Connecticut Pride. Connecticut Pride this year was pushed from uh, July, I'm sorry, from June, when, uh, which is now National Pride Month, um, to September 17th at the Bushnell Park. And it was done primarily, um, from my understanding, in order to um, align with the school systems and to try and get some of the uh, anti-bullying um, messages into, worked into the Pride. Um, so that's Saturday, September 17th at Bushnell Park. Um, we've got to get our application in still to get a booth yes. there. So um, do we. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we will see you there. And um, they, they, it's, a, it's always a fun day. There's uh, food vendors. There's all kinds of, uh, of informational. And uh, they've had henna artists and craft vendors in the past. And they have entertainment all day. Um, it looks like um, Sister Funk will be headlining again, um, as well as several other folks. Uh, uh, Lady Tatiana will be back, Raina Elise, Leslie Avery, the Hartford Hartlets, Harlots, uh, Chastity, Elm City Dance Collective, Christine W., Nina Flowers, the Imperial Sovereign Court of All Connecticut, and Scotty Gage. So it, you can uh, come to the park uh, Saturday, September 17th. and We'll give a cheesecake. And Callie usually, well usually, so far, 100% of the time, Callie makes the little um, individual cheesecakes, the little mini cupcakes. Mini cheesecakes. Cheesecakes. People come and eat them. It's an excuse to come. It's a, it's a great way to make <laughs> friends. Would you like a free cheesecake? <laughs> yeah, we're giving cheesecakes uh, and condoms. We will again have our condoms care of our, uh, right. our, our, our local hospital friends to help promote safe sex. It's a lot easier to give away the cheesecakes than the condoms. Yeah. I'm not sure why that is exactly. But <laughs> it, it may be a little worrisome, but. <laughs> but, but yeah, you'll, you'll be there. Um, I, yeah, there's, there's usually a Unitarian Universalist presence. I, 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 our church pretty regularly has a booth, or we split it with one of the other Unitarian Universalist congregations. The West Hartford Unitarian Universalist is usually there. Um, so yeah. Yeah, cool. Yeah. But it's, it's a good time. It's just a little late this year. Um, but, but that's cool. It was, it's for a good reason. It also tends to be sweltering hot yes, when it's, it's in June. It, it is. That's, that's true. true. So maybe this won't be flip-flop weather in September, but uh, mm. it ought to still be a nice day. I hope so. so. Bring, bring the snow shovel. No. Bring the snow no. shovel. No. No. Bring the roof rakes. Yeah. No. But, but yeah, we will certainly be there. We're always there. So. Um, but yeah, anyway. Um, there's something else you wanted to talk about, yes? Well, not necessarily. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. It w well, it was, um, I, I had one note from, um, from the Advocate website about transgender documentary Southern Comfort, a um, new musical based on Kate Davis's award-winning transgender documentary Southern Comfort will premiere at Cap 21's Black Box Theater in New York City in October. Cool. Um, the film chronicles the last year of Robert Ede's life his love with partner Lola Cola, his adopted family, and life in, rural, in the rural South as a transgender man. It became one of the most critically acclaimed films ever made about transgender people. And it'll be a um, musical at Cap 21's Black Box next month. Cool. Well, that well, goes back two to months. what we were talking about, is this sort of the, the way um, we are becoming more mainstream, I think, which is, which is kind of cool. You work your way up the social ladder. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But, but it's a good thing. It's certainly, um, you know, we, we certainly appreciate all the work that, uh, that you've done um, for, for, well, for everybody, but, but <laughs> on, on behalf of people like us and, and, um, and other marginalized groups, I, yeah. um, I feel a little funny sometimes referring to us as a marginalized group, but certainly a lot of, I, I mean, I haven't seen but a lot of the, well, I have seen discrimination, okay, so. Mm. It's a, it, it is a funny word, and it just reminds me that language can be tough. How do, you, how do you describe people, and if you describe people as a marginalized group, then you're kind of, you're possibly implying a victim mentality, and, and yeah. there's problems with that. Um, but you also need some way to say, look, here's a class of people who are 
in some way marginalized. The system yeah. is working yeah. against them. Uh, and, and there's an opposite class of people that are privileged by the system. This isn't fair. So whatever language we end up using, uh, yeah. you, you, have know, to be able you have to be able to say something about yeah. it. We, we've had that conversation even around the terms transsexual, transgender, gender nonconforming, yeah. gay, lesbian, uh, GLBTQA, you know, no matter how you draw the lines to divvy up the groups of people, when you're going to be talking, especially in like legal terms, when you're going to be talking to people, trying to educate, you have to be able to bound them sure. somehow. Yeah. yeah. It's sort of necessary even if it's uncomfortable. Yeah. We have a, a challenge. I don't, I'm hoping we have enough time. Yeah, um, about a minute. Where, you know, in all the hymns, you've got this language of brothers and That's sisters. Positive. Yeah. And there are people in the trans community and allies who say, well, not everyone fits <laughs> as a brother or a son or a daughter. So what do we do about that? Can we find new language? Yeah. Anyway, That's very interesting. we are, <laughs> That's we are just about out of time. Um, Reverend Pollock, I want to thank you so much for coming and talking to us. And, and please, um, come back and, and um, talk to us again. I'd, I'd love to. This has been fun. I really appreciate <laughs> the invitation, and, and I look forward to doing it again. Yeah, and thank you so much for all the, the hard work you and, and, and your organizations that ha have done. Um, You're welcome. Yeah, Continue really to speak very eloquently and convincingly. Yes. Yeah. That's the plan. <laughs> but but That's please, the plan. come back, come back and, uh, and see us again. We'd love to have you on again. Okay. We'll do it. So Thanks. Thank you so much. And thank you, everybody, for watching, and we will see you next week.